Good afternoon to um, people in this room at the Wilson Center and to, I gather, more than a thousand people around the world are joining us here. It's uh, a great honor to be at the Wilson Center and to thank my good friend, Jane Harmon, the director. <coughs> it's really fitting to be here. Jane is a great internationalist, as was Woodrow Wilson, for whom this center is named and we're in the room named for Daniel Patrick Moynihan, also a great internationalist himself and active in the Fulbright program, which we're going to discuss today, and ambassador to India, where the Fulbright program is particularly strong, and a gentleman farmer whose uh, farm was about 10 miles from the farm where I grew up in upstate New York, and he was my senator. There are plenty of seats up front, so uh, please join us. And the big names of uh, big names of Washington American political history. We're talking Wilson, Fulbright, Moynihan. Today we have to look at this man. Think about the birthday of farm boy, haberdasher, president, and signatory of the Fulbright legislation, Harry S. Truman, born in Lamar, Missouri, May 8th, 1848. Truman was 61 on this day when he announced VE Day, victory in Europe, announcing the ending of World War II, May 8th, 1945. A year later, Truman signed Fulbright legislation into law, and in the fall of 1948, 47 Americans and 36 scholars from China, Burma, and the Philippines took rickshaws, bicycles, Packards, Pan Am, Clipper, the Cunard Line, and the first diesel trains that were introduced that year, transporting Fulbright scholars into the future. 83 of them in 1948, about 8,000 this year, more than 350,000 over the last 68 years from 100 or 80, 80 so countries. So there, back, so there you have Truman, Fulbright, and I love that this is the case, the unidentified man <laughs> with his hand in his pocket have nobody's ever found out who that is smirking on that day in August 1946 August 1st when the legislation was signed what I love about that year is that old Harry and Bill had complicated histories even in such a uh, celebratory time 1946 and the end of the war brought Richard Nixon and Joe McCarthy to Congress and the first Republican Congress in almost 20 years Truman's polls were at 36%. Fulbright suggested to the press that Truman might like to resign. Truman suggested back to the press that he didn't give a damn what Senator Halfbright had to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it really is a good thing we're starting to get more women in leadership, I think. So, these are the Northern Lights. On a Fulbright trip last fall, I went to the Arctic Circle to see them, called by Galileo the Aurora Borealis, and Aurora is a goddess of dawn, Borealis, the north wind. And they reminded me of the head of the philosophy department looking up the sky and out of those clouds comes an angel and says to her, which do you decide? You want truth, beauty, or $10 million? She decides truth, of course, and the angel whispers it into her ear and she sits there silently and her colleagues are around the fire that snow, 
and he whispers, and she sits there, and her colleague whispers, you know, you kind of have to say something, tell us what all that truth is, and she whispers back, I should have chosen the $10 million. <laughs> we need to choose, and Fulbright, we need to measure and in that sense, that's why we're here today. We're gonna to talk about the Fulbright effect. We need to show, we need to say here, this is what I have. And it makes some sense, taxpayers support this program. The Fulbright effect, effect is what comes out of what we do. We know so much comes out of what Fulbright does, what the people who have been Fulbrighters do. I've traveled all over the world for this program. It's amazing the people I've met. When a 30-year-old Spanish teacher from Oklahoma or a 20 or an 82-year-old biologist from the Philippines tells me that the Fulbright program changed my life. In some way it's odd to say to them, well, you know, that's not quite enough. But let me tell you some of those people. Here's Iliac Diaz, who developed the, oh, and there's some other man over here. I don't know if you recognize him with the sunglasses. That's actually our Secretary of State. But Iliac Diaz developed the Leader of Light Initiative, bringing economic bottle bulbs to thousands of homes in Manila slums, as well as homes in India, Indonesia, and Switzerland. And then here <coughs> is VJ. Can we get to our next one? Is he stuck? There he is. There's VJ Charyar from <coughs> uh, India, who's developing technologies for public health and converse, uh, conservation, and made right there a waterless urinal, and got with his Fulbright an ability to market that urinal. And then the next one we have Benjamin Berno, who developed and improved HIV testing through a whole infrastructure through South Africa. And then where's Adrian Strong? There she is. And Adrian did this extraordinary thing. She conducted hundreds of hours of interviews and observations that documented the abuse and poor treatment that women faced in giving birth in hospitals and clinics in Tanzania and helped tell a story to officials there that explained why fewer than 50% of women give birth in formal health settings in Tanzania. And then here's Tahani Almagri in Libya who works with US aid in Libya for women's rights and civil society participation. And she founded the Libyan program, just began a few years ago again. She founded the Fulbright Alumni Association in Libya, and she offers free English classes to refugee children there. And here's Aaron Schneier who has an MTVU Fulbright and has formed Heartbeat, which unites Israeli and Palestinian music youth musicians to strive for peace and has performed right here in Washington, Congress with his group. And here you have to see this. This, oh, that's Michael. I thought we were gonna see Jesse next, but yeah, you hear, let's see, let's see Jesse. Oh, you don't have Jesse? Okay. Well, let's see, Michael. Um, <laughs> Jesse, you were going to see, but I'll talk about Jesse anyway, since we're not going to see it. Jesse is, uh, Jesse Apple was a Fulbrighter in China two years ago in 2012, and he and some Fulbright friends took to the streets, got silly, and made a parody of Gangnam Style if you remember it from two summers ago. It was all the rage in the summer of 2012, and they called it Laowai style, which was foreigner style. And they posted on Yuku, 
which is YouTube in China. And they thought, so a few people might see it, and besides the crowds that would be just sort of around them, pointing and laughing. And they did that because Jesse is a nice Brandeis boy who went to China to study comedy, and he did what every young Fulbright comedian does. He found a master comedian to apprentice with and then found something perfect to make fun of himself and some other Americans and then put it on YouTube so that a few people would see it. And in fact, a few people did. A million in the first five days, tens of millions in the few days after that. Live performances on Chinese television, parodies of Jesse's parody, people stopping him on the street throughout China, eighth graders in Maryland making their own Laowei style as part of class projects to learn about China, and now he's a Fulbright celebrity. Uh, and here's Michael. Uh, that's actually the official Fulbright costume. <laughs> Michael is a Fulbright Clinton fellow who's um, in Myanmar, which I love. Remember, in 1948, I said that in Burma we had some of our first Fulbright scholars, and we're back again. And he's working toward affordable and sustainable energy solutions, doing feasible study studies for a uh, small-scale hydropower project. And I just wanted to uh, show you a little thing about, you know, we're always talking STEM in these uh, projects of doing, can you show us that little thing? I was talking to my friend about this, the artist uh, said, well, you know, we've always been talking about science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, 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 and here we get this little STEM. And what I think about Fulbright doing is adding a little art to all of this, adding that little truth and beauty to the, to the money, and then you get that steam instead of just STEM, and look what happens when you add a little steam mm -hmm. to your stem-like thing. Oh my God, you've got a great tree. I thought that was a good idea. So anyway, what this, co this conference today, conversation is talking about is both the stem and the steam, the effect and the measurement. How does Fulbright do it? What can we do more of? We've got an incredible array of panelists, we've got our incomparable vice chair of the Fulbright Board, Betty Castor, to lead us in this conversation, and we've got all of you with uh, lots of questions to ask of them. So thanks all for coming, and we're thrilled to have you and thrilled to have them for a really interesting conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> thanks, Tom, and thanks for running through some of our uh, successes. Those of us uh, on the Fulbright Board are very proud of the members of Fulbright. We're proud of our long history uh, and, many, and many successes. But we're, uh, we invited the panelists today uh, to have a conversation with us about how we can make Fulbright better, how we can build more collaboration how we can take advantage of other organizations which, like Fulbright, uh, have their own uh, success stories to tell. So I'm going to introduce our panelists and then ask each one of them to uh, respond to a, a gentle uh, interrogation, uh, after which they will uh, engage one another and then we will open this discussion up to those of you who are here and those who are somewhere else uh, with all of your questions. So without further ado, let me start uh, at my right and your left with Leah Shandley. Leah is the director of the Commons <coughs> Lab within uh, Science and Technology Innovation Program here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. She's first because we're in her space. <laughs> and, um, and we've had a wonderful uh, 
time here today uh, engaging in our own agenda. Leah directs a, uh, a scientifically based center that looks for new innovations uh, and looks at ways to engage uh, citizens in the discussion of science and the implementation of scientific methods. She um, is a graduate of Florida State uh, University, one of my sister institutions uh, in, in Florida, and uh, also uh, did time at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Next to her is Daniel Edelson, who is Vice President for Education at National Geographic. Wouldn't you all like to have that job? <laughs> I mean, the resources, every time I think of National Geographic, I think of all the great resources uh, that that wonderful institution has. Daniel is a scientist. Uh, he uh, holds a PhD in computer science, artificial intelligence, so watch out, uh, from Northwestern University and a BS in engineering sciences from Yale, and he is going to share uh, some of his vision, some of the expertise that he has learned and has uh, taken to National Geographic. To my left and your right is Brett Bruin, who is uh, the Director of Global Engagement for the National Security Council at the White House. He is actually a career service uh, officer. He started, uh, I think his first assignment was the Ivory Coast. Uh, but he went on to um, Iraq, uh, Venezuela, and most recently uh, Madagascar. Uh, he holds a, a prime uh, position today in implementing the president's new initiative named YALI, and we'll get into that when it's his turn to speak. And to my um, left, far left, and your right is my newest best friend, Agnes Goye. I say that because uh, I started my teaching career in Uganda, and lo and behold, here is Agnes uh, coming to us as a graduate of the Humphrey program. Uh, she, um, it, that's the professional exchange program of the uh, Fulbright. Uh, she uh, has multiple degrees from Makere University in Kampala, U Uganda, and did her Fulbright uh, at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs in 2010-2011. She uh, has gained a lot of uh, expertise in citizen movements, but today is an expert in human trafficking. And we are going to talk to her about that and the tools that she has found helpful. So I'm going to turn uh, first to Leah and uh, ask her to really tell us what this citizen science uh, is all about. Can Fulbright uh, students and scholars who are out there, how can they use what you have learned and what you are implementing here at the Wilson Center? Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for, for uh, joining us today. Um, the Commons Lab looks at the role of technologies and approaches like crowdsourcing and citizen science uh, for addressing scientific and public policy challenges. We look at the barriers and the accelerators to collaborative innovation, um, bridging, uh, serving as a bridge, uh, as the Wilson Center does, between government and the public, research institutions, nonprofits, and the private sector, uh, bringing folks together from interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approaches and multiple perspectives to solve public policy challenges. So with regards to citizen science, uh, I think the uh, context often is that it's an educational tool, which it is. People can uh, participate in the scientific process and through that learn how to do science, learn scientific principles. But where there's a huge movement going, and uh, Danny's part of it as well, uh, forming the National uh, Citizen Science Association. And in Europe, there's a Citizen Science Association is really looking at the role that average people, uh, K through 12, to uh, I do it? professionals like yourself, to <laughs> retirees, um, collect data, help analyze data that actually supports scientific research, that supports the scientific community or that supports public policy goals. 
Um, so as I said, there's a couple of national associations, uh, well, here in the U.S. and in Europe and Australia and others are gaining interest, so it's, it's gaining momentum. There's a long-standing program through NASA called the GLOW program that might serve as a model for Fulbright for their teacher uh, fellowships to, to look at and engage. Um, but I think there's other platforms as well now moving from kind of the traditional in the field or at a lab bench to crowdsourcing platforms or crowd-based science where we've got online internet-based platforms, uh, say ideation platforms, where people of multiple disciplines can contribute ideas and other people can build an I ideas or say, oh, that's being done here or maybe you want to think about this. And then they can vote it up and down and so you end up selecting some of the you know, top ideas that emerge. Uh, other platforms include grand challenges and prizes, uh, which the US government here has used quite a lot of, but one of the nice models is Open IDEO. And uh, that uh, brings, again, people from multiple disciplines, like the scholars, from all over the world, different countries, different disciplines, different skill sets. And through this online platform, they pose a question. So for example, how might we make low-income urban areas safer and more empowering for women and girls? And people will contribute some research or stories, uh, resources that might help with the thinking on this. And then there's an idea challenge. People contribute multiple ideas and they go through an iterative process of feedback and refinement and judging. And so uh, finalists are selected, then those are prototyped and winning ideas, and then they do follow up with impact. So suppose there's somebody here or listening in wherever mm -hmm. that has an interest in pollution of lakes, mm -hmm. and they want to spawn citizen information. Where would they go? Would they come th through your, the Wilson Center website? Where would <laughs> well, I've, uh, there are multiple organizations actually working in this space. I think the Gates Foundation USAID actually has a, a water security for food. So is there a clearinghouse? Do you have a, any kind of a clearinghouse or anything? Like that? Uh, I don't necessarily have a clearinghouse, but I certainly, mm -hmm. if people have questions, would be happy to point them in the direction of, of groups that are doing this kind of work. All right, let's move on to uh, Danny. Uh, Danny, with all those resources you mm -hmm. have at uh, National Geographic, what are the tools that you think are or the premier tool that you think is most effective in global education and in networking? Well, um, first of all, I want to thank you and thank the scholarship board for including me in this. Uh, I, when I think about what the uh, Fulbright effect is, uh, I think it's easy to focus on the direct Fulbright uh, participant, but I am inclined to think that the real Fulbright effect is the connections or are the connections that that individual makes both when they are uh, in their visiting location and back to their home country. And um, we, there's an interesting thing. I'm sure s some of you know that uh, there is a new Fulbright program that uh, the National Geographic is participating in that's focused on digital storytelling. And the, it's a uh, small program. It's in its first year. The first group of people have applied. And the idea behind it is people can apply who, have, who want to go overseas because they want to tell a story. They may not have all the background or skills to tell that story. And that's where National Geographic comes in. Uh, our organization, our photographers, our writers, our editors, uh, our filmmakers will be working with them and mentoring them so that they can tell the story that they have applied to travel to be able to, to tell. And that's a new special program and I'm, I'm very excited about it and uh, I can't take any personal credit for it, but I, I'm delighted to be part of the organization that, that is part of it. But to me, the lesson there is uh, that there's an opportunity for all Fulbright scholars, teachers, everybody involved in a Fulbright program to be a digital storyteller, him or, or herself, and that there are amazing platforms that are now available for people to be able to do that. I, I actually think that the future of National Geographic lies in as much our ability to enable ordinary people to become storytellers as it is 
in our traditional way of identifying the really special and unique I explorers and, and storytellers. And I just wanted to um, kind of make this concrete through a few um, images. Uh, we also, I, I lead uh, National Geographic's education programs, and one of our programs is that we are able to fund teachers from the US to travel uh, in, on various programs. And part of this program that we do with those teachers is helping them to become digital storytellers. Because we, it's a, it is a, something of a reward that these teachers who have exceptional careers are able to be part of this program. But the real reason we're doing this is to enable those teachers to bring experiences back to their students, to, to their colleagues. And so uh, I have just a few images of uh, these teachers who have uh, traveled to the Arctic about the ways they've been able to bring their, their stories back. And um, the first one that's, that's up here now is a, a teacher who just used uh, pretty much an ordinary blogging platform, but was able to use it to bring back photographs and, and keep a journal and share that both in real time with her students back home and then uh, after, after she had returned. Um, this is another I interesting example. Uh, being from National Geographic, I want to make sure that you see both photos and maps. And this is a, this is a, t <laughs> this is a teacher who used uh, a set of Google tools uh, to tell a story uh, on the map and to be able to link in this case, the journal entries uh, with a map of his or her travels. Um, another technology that we just heard about a moment ago, uh, this is a teacher who created uh, his own video story and used YouTube as a way of sharing it. And then the last thing I want to show you is just um, a, a set of tools that we've been developing at National Geographic for that purpose that I mentioned before, which is to enable you or me or anybody else to tell particular kinds of stories. And this is where we are actually putting together maps and, and storytelling. And we call these geo stories. And this is the, the cover page, the title page that you see up there right now. But what it enables you to do is to create a story where each story is associated with a, each page in the story, each point in the story, is associated with a particular location and gives you the opportunity to give, to create a customized map that captures the context for that part of the story. That's on the left, if the slide behind me shows what I think it is. And multiple photos, there's only one showing over there on, on the top on the right, and text. So it's the beginning of a, what I think of as a really exciting digital storytelling platform that really is about place. The prominence of the maps has to do with the fact that stories are about people and they're about places and they're about the relationship between people and places. And a Fulbright participant, a fellow or a scholar, their experience is very much a place-based experience. And I think there's a huge opportunity to magnify what, you ref what Tom referred to earlier as the Fulbright effect by encouraging em, them and empowering them to become st digital storytellers and to spread that effect broadly through all the communities that, that they may be connected to. Great. Thanks very much. And everybody knows where you can get in touch. Yes. <laughs> There's a, they have a great uh, website, and you can also subscribe. <laughs> uh, our next uh, speaker is Brett uh, Bruin. I think I uh, did not talk about your education, but he's a very well-educated gentleman. He has <laughs> multiple degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he has a degree in international relations and political science, and he holds a master's in global history. He is now involved in building a brand new program, and uh, the acronym is YALI, and it's it's quite uh, different from, from Fulbright, but we're interested in how we can connect with that program, so why don't you tell us about it? Glad to. Um, and thank you to the Fulbright Commission um, and to the Wilson Center for organizing this event, for, for inviting us to um, participate. And, and I think it's an exciting time in the world of public diplomacy. Um, 
I, I am a public diplomacy officer, and, and one of my um, most um, fulfilling roles was actually doing Fulbright interviews overseas, and, and I always look forward to it every year. Um, and there's no doubt that the Fulbright program will continue to play uh, a preeminent role in public diplomacy in the years to come. Um, as uh, was mentioned, we are in the process of developing um, a number of new initiatives, among which is the Young African Leaders Initiative. Uh, this summer, uh, the President will host a summit, um, actually two summits, the first with um, the Washington Fellows, um, who are 500 young African leaders, uh, selected amongst 50,000 applicants um, to participate um, in the uh, summit, both with uh, the president as well as to attend six weeks of uh, institutes at uh, universities across the country. Um, and, and I actually, on, on that, want to pick up on a couple of the themes that um, my co-panelists mentioned. And the first was, was continuum, and that, that we really are, um, as part of the Young African Leaders Initiative, and the Washington Fellowship looking at a continuum. Um, this is not uh, only about an exchange. Uh, this is about uh, an engagement that goes far beyond um, the time um, and the place, to use the um, word that was so um, well put by um, my colleague from uh, National Geographic, that um, the Washington Fellows have while they're here in the US, um, but how do we continue to engage with them when they return to their country? How do we enable them um, to reach back and to pull on resources, on uh, individuals and opportunities. Um, and it is, it is a massive undertaking. I've been uh, at it now for almost a year. And um, it is um, an exciting opportunity because what it involves, I think, will actually have um, a lot of, um, uh, of impact not only on the other young uh, leaders initiatives, which I should mention, we are also rolling out the president just a couple weeks ago, uh, rolled out the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative, um, and stay tuned, uh, there will be more to come. Um, but it is um, also changing the way that we look at exchanges more broadly. I think Fulbright um, certainly um, has uh, a, a, uh, a lot to expect from these exchanges because um, for a long time, one of the criticisms of the Fulbright program was as magnificent as the experience was um, while the students were either here in the U.S. or overseas, um, we didn't do a good enough job of maintaining both that contact, and you know, often you'll hear about the alumni engagement, um, and in the President's uh, FY15 request, we have um, substantially increased uh, resources for alumni engagement, but that's only part of it. It's not enough simply to invite um, former um, Fulbrighters to a reception at the embassy uh, once a year uh, to send them a, a holiday greeting card. Um, we need to find a way to meaningfully uh, maintain and to amplify or, or magnify the Fulbright effect, as, as was mentioned. Um, and that, I that in incorporates uh, a whole series of activities which um, go before the participant uh, starts the program, uh, as we're doing now with uh, the Washington Fellows, engaging them virtually um, while they're here in the United States, uh, enabling them to conduct programs back uh, in their own country. So for instance, if uh, they are a, a biomedical researcher, that they are tapping into resources on campus while they're here and sharing those back um, in their home country, and then when they go back, that they're able to draw on those resources. And in the case of the Young African Leaders Initiative, we're um, rolling out um, some, some ra rather substantial um, follow-on programs in the form of regional leadership centers, which will be public-private partnerships spread across um, the continent, uh, along with um, the Young African Leaders Initiative Network, um, which um, will offer, a, as the President um, mentioned uh, in a video message that was sent to the 49,500 um, that weren't selected, the opportunity for um, the um, participants in the program as well as those who applied um, to engage in a whole series of um, virtual um, engagements, be they classes, be they um, certificate or even degree programs, uh, as well as um, networking opportunities, mentoring opportunities, mm -hmm. um, and other um, uh, access to, to seed funding um, and, and internships. So we are looking at exchanges in a whole new way. I, I think it's a very exciting time. Uh, the President um, has certainly prioritized exchanges 
um, which is, is no small uh, effort at a time when the budget environment um, is quite um, uh, limited and, and yet ECA's um, budget line was increased. Um, now certainly folks will um, look at the, the Fulbright line and, and, and legitimately ask questions about um, why that may have um, been, I would um, argue, slightly reduced. But in fact, there are a number of other initiatives that um, I think are going to contribute both to the Fulbright program and others. One I would point out is the Rapid Response Fund, um, which was created specifically so that we can make programs like Fulbright uh, more um, responsive to world events. We, we've noticed um, only in the past few months how um, no longer are events being shaped in um, the time span of decades or years, they're being shaped in the time span of months, days, and hours. And we need to have the ability um, in situations such as Ukraine, South Sudan, Syria, to react much more quickly so that we can have um, an impact. Uh, I've talked with colleagues in the case of South Sudan that you know, the moment that um, a, um, a peace agreement is signed, we need to engage the parties on both sides in an exchange where they come back here, um, they are immersed in the knowledge and, and with the experts on reconciliation, and, and then they are immediately plugged back into that process. And I think that uh, will help to make um, programs uh, such as the Fulbright much more um, uh, impactful um, in helping to shape world events. Well, one quick uh, question. Um, unlike the Fulbright program, this program, the YALI program, will be short term. These will be students that come for a short period of time. And what's going to happen? Where are they going? So um, as I mentioned, they will be here um, for a f initial six-week period um, at an intensive institute in the United States um, at one of 20 universities um, across the country. Uh, they will attend a, a summit with the president here in Washington. And then 100 of them will actually stay on um, for up to uh, eight weeks of professional development um, at uh, a government uh, institution, private sector um, company, or uh, an NGO. Um, but it doesn't stop there. And, and that's where building out um, engagements, be they in the form of continuing um, online education, be it in the form of, of programs at, at these regional leadership centers uh, and others, we are, are looking at, at a whole uh, spectrum of uh, resources and opportunities for them to continue to engage with. Great. Thank you. Well, Agnes, you've heard the uh, other three panelists. Your experience is a professional experience, so it's somewhat different than s some of the other programs. But uh, what did you learn in, uh, during your Humphrey uh, experience that you have been able to take with you? What kind of networks were, did you enable? Wow, uh, thank you very much. Um, I was here 2010-11, uh, Hubert Humphrey Fellowship. And uh, what an experience. Uh, the first time they said I was going to Minnesota, you know, it's a cold place. <laughs> 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 but what I know with cold places is that they have hidden treasures. And my host university was the University of Minnesota, and my area of specialization was human trafficking policy and prevention. And I'm actually very glad that I went to Minnesota because there was a lot, you know, to learn from there. Uh, not only did they acquire, you know, the, the skills and knowledge, because it's that part of our, our academics, and I also decided to choose uh, those areas where I could get skills, not just theory, because I can sit back in Uganda, you know, and read theory. So I did um, subjects like community organizing, had, uh, you know, training from people like, you know, Harry Boyett, you know, who worked for Martin Luther King Jr., and I thought that was great to ask him about how they did it, you know, in those days. I did immigration and public policy, uh, which I took back because, you know, in, in Uganda we are starting to craft our own immigration policy. And luckily enough, I've been given that, you know, responsibility to do that. So those are the skills I had there, you know, to take back. But apart from the academics, you know, you get also to do the professional uh, development. So what I did is to really find out who is doing um, things about human trafficking. I started attending task force meetings uh, at their uh, in, in Minnesota state, and that helped me to see how do they do it. Because right now in Uganda, when I went back, you know, I'm a member of the National Task Force. 
you know, to counter trafficking. So in there, we, d we, are, we are dealing with the national action plans. We are doing with the strategies on awareness campaigns. So embedding myself in what was happening in Minnesota helped me. I went to the Women Foundation of, of Minnesota. They had a, a, a five-year uh, program project about uh, Minnesota Girls Are Not For Sale. So I was actually with the team, you know, to craft that, you know, for, the, for, for Minnesota. So I was actually doing the actual things. And then uh, besides that, I also worked with organizing apprenticeship project because I know you have to tell the stories. I was given a, a cameraman and I had to go around Minnesota to see how they deal with organizing, you know, interviewing people, you know, to the capital, you know, to the, you know, suburbs, you know, people who are doing things like organizing, which is helping me now in my work. Uh, but what I took uh, most, because you know, you spend this year, but what is important is what you do when you get back home. Uh, because for me, when I went back, you know, I went with the certificates and all that, but for me that was responsibility. So how did I um, deal with that? Uh, while I was here, uh, there was a call of commitments of action, you know, at the Clinton Global Initiative. So I said, okay. <laughs> I, 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 I said I know what I want to do. Uh, I want to create this rehabilitation center and all that. So I sat down uh, one night in my room yeah, I started writing my kind of proposal, so I sent it in. And, and to be honest, you know, I wasn't expecting much. Uh, then after a while, I received uh, a few weeks. Um, they said, oh, out of, uh, I don't know, thousands of applications, your, your, your application has been accepted. And uh, to go to the Clinton Global Initiative, I thought it was maybe a spam, you know, one of these things. <laughs> 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 because you don't believe things like that so easily. So I went to my academic advisor, I said, Ted, is, is, is this true? Uh, you know, after a while I said, then he said, oh yeah. So I packed up my bags, I went to San Diego, where I met with uh, President Clinton. While there, you know, uh, we are given a lot of training, you know, how to, um, how to develop your, your, your commitment of action, how do you raise money for it? So you're talking about fundraising skills, you're talking about, you know, how do you communicate? You met with commitment makers, you know, young people doing a lot of things, you know, globally around the world. So we networked because my commitment can feed into yours. And we met, you know, uh, practitioners, celebrities uh, in, in that area. And that picture there, we actually did also a voluntary activity. And that was at the food bank at, uh, uh, in, in San Diego. Uh, so for me, that is learning. Uh, that was learning. So. I committed uh, to do um, three things. I said I was going to create a rehabilitation center for victims of trafficking. I'm talking mainly about, you know, especially children who are abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, because I know that 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 um, that Lord's Resistance Army insurgency affected me uh, w when I was growing up. You know, running, you know, through bushes and ending up internally displaced camps and things like that. So for me, I knew I had to do something in that area. Then I also committed to train law enforcement. I said at first I'm going to train 1,000, but to date I've surpassed. And not just training in Uganda, but you know, in the region, and also coordinating internationally, and, uh, and generally speaking about issues of human trafficking you know, everywhere. So I talk about trafficking every day, uh, whether I'm writing it or telling somebody, uh, because that is my mission. Um, so another thing I did uh, was, uh, because the Humphrey program, you know, gives you money to do a, a number of uh, uh, activities. So one of those things, you, you know, you network around. I, I went even the Not For Sale Academy in San, in San Diego, did uh, a lot of training there with San Jose Police and FBI in the area. And uh, I started saving some money, you know, instead of eating, you know, <laughs> good food. <laughs> <laughs> you eat canned food and all that. Very so, common among students. Yes. So uh, with $1,000 eventually, like through, through the year, I went to Books for Africa because I, I, w I used to talk a lot, you know, about, about that, that's the key thing. I mean, talk about the things you want to do because people will hold you accountable to it. So I went to Books for Africa. I said I want to take a container of books, went 3000 to Uganda. So with the $1,000, they uploaded my, um, my project on their website. 
So I've, I started uh, fundraising because I was, I was already uh, looking at how people are doing fundraising in Minnesota. I would go and actually be a guest speaker and fundraise for people, you know, with other organizations, uh, people who are what, because I was also learning, but I also wanted to give back. Because the thing about the Humphrey Fellowship is not just about getting, but what do you also have to give? So anyway, I, I, I raised the container. Uh, so 23,000 books uh, is what I started with. Uh, that, that, that was funny because when, because I actually went to the board that received the book, so I drove with the truck, not me driving, somebody else. This is a Fulbright multiplier effect. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when, when the, the kids saw, they thought it was a bus because they've never seen such a big truck, you know, uh, coming within the, within the area. So it couldn't actually fit in the gate. So that's why, you know, those books are being ferried with a smaller car inside. So still see that excitement. So for me, that, that's what gets me up in the morning. And I see uh, Books for Africa up to date. You know, we are taking like 69,000 books, you know, to Uganda for the education of children, uh, victims of trafficking, vulnerable children. So that is one of the partnerships which is still continuing up to date, you know, with Books for Africa. Um, then, I, then we had sister schools. Um, and the interesting thing, sister schools is uh, based in Seattle area, but when I was in Minnesota, there is um, a not for sale um, who, uh, chair in, in Minnesota called Dick Wexler. So Dick introduced me to somebody, you know, it's an uh, online, and then that person also introduces me to another who was coming to you guys and said, you must meet Agnes, you have to meet her. So anyway, <laughs> uh, he came and met with me, and what uh, Sister School does is uh, children within the Seattle area, you know, they donate a lot of items, you know, to other children uh, in Uganda. So through that donation, they write letters, uh, you know, to the children. And, uh, you know, they, they do a little fundraising in their own way, children giving other children. And when the other children receive those gifts and also write letters, uh, that exchange, it's so powerful. And I started volunteering with them, you know, going to orphanages, going to work. And before I knew it, they asked me to join the board. So I'm now in the board, uh, you know, of sister schools, and we continue to ship and, and, and do those exchanges between the, the children uh, in the Seattle area and the ones in Uganda. Um, now, there comes Hearts for Peace. Uh, that's one of my favorite programs because wh while, we are doing, while I was doing uh, rehabilitation work for children, uh, uh, victims of trafficking and all that in northern Uganda, I, I paused a little bit. I said, what happens to the women? You know, because, you know, people rush for the children, but women also come wounded, you know, affected by the war, uh, you know, issues of rape. And, and so the chairman of the area told me, okay, there's a group of uh, 15 women, and then I took a bus because I wanted to meet with them. And uh, when I arrived, they were actually not 15, they are 14. The 15th was a man. I said, how come you have one man in the, in the team? They said, because he knows how to read and write. So that's why they are like that. So anyway, I had issues with that, but I thanked the gentleman you know, for being uh, you know, in the team and for the contribution. And then I started asking them where they live. They, then I started hearing stories of homelessness. You know, some of them you know, didn't have where to stay. Uh, their husbands maybe were abducted and they were, they were accused for it because they use you to come back and terrorize your communities. So people were, you know, living with children, girls, you know, looking for where to stay every day. So there and then, something I did not plan, but those are things, the skills I took back, you know, that people have uh, the responsibility or the ability, you know, to, to do things by themselves. I said, why can't we build these huts ourselves? What do we have in the community? So the women started brainstorming. Oh, I have grass somewhere which we can use. I have a place where we can do, make the, the, the bricks. Oh, I, I have some wood somewhere. I said, okay, what do we need that requires money? It is zeroed down to nails, you know, certain things. I said, okay. So before I left, you know, I said, okay, no, it was urgent uh, because uh, we, we also reached out to the church, which gave us some land for the homeless women. So that's how the Hearts for Peace program, you know, was born. So women building their own hearts. And guess what? As we build their hearts, the men kind of get embarrassed and they come and join us. <laughs> and uh, it's usually an exciting time because Save not just... the world over. <laughs> 
Because it's not just about building hearts, it's, it's about peace and reconciliation. As we're building, we are talking about issues that affect us. We are talking about issues of HIV AIDS, which is affecting the community because of the, the insurgency and the war. And the, that feeling, you know, children, and when we are building your home, we are eating meals together. So that's how the Hearts for Peace program works. That's me, and that's how I enjoy my life. Um, so, so, you know, th those are communities, just showing you pictures. And this picture is particularly interesting because uh, while we are building the hearts, then there was this little boy, you know, seated there reading a book from Books for Africa. So he's reading and we are building, and that's education, you know? So I love that picture. Uh, I like that too uh, because <laughs> Uh, when, you, when, when somebody has their home, so I saw that, they said, don't enter in my house without permission. So for me, what does that mean? It means ownership. It means somebody has a home, okay? So for me, I like that. So it's not my home. I'm just sitting in somebody else's home. I'm, I'm about to finish. Um, that picture particularly, you know, touched me a lot because when I started the Hearts for Peace program, we, I built a heart, okay? And the day I went to visit, you know, when they are moving in, so that heart accommodated 15 people. It was a three generation. We had a grandmother and her, her daughters, you know, and, and children. And so for me, uh, when you see something like that, you know, because they, they own it, I knew it is not just enough because you have to build now, you know, more hearts. Um, you ha every, every woman, you know, deserves, you know, to have that privacy. You know, you have to have, you know, the toilets where they, they will use. And, uh, you know, today I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report that, you know, besides that, now we have three, you know, around there. And, and for me, that's the Hearts for Peace program. I think let me end there. To, um, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to take the... Um, Chair's prerogative here, we were going to engage the panel members in discussions with one another, but uh, you, the audience here in this room, as well as the audience uh, listening in from wherever, uh, are here because you knew about this, and I want to give you all uh, an opportunity to ask your questions. So with the, uh, with the panelists' agreements, uh, let's go to our question and answer period and start it here in this room. Now, we, are, we have two um, microphones, and the only thing that I would ask is that whoever is asking the question, address it to someone, but please know that all of the panel members can have an opportunity to jump in and respond if you would like, uh, and then we will take a question from one of our remote uh, listeners. So please don't be shy. Someone start us off. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Mahabub from Bangladesh. I'm a current Humphrey Fellow. Ah. And my question to you, uh, we know, I mean, what is the Humphrey Fellowship and it's a truly life-changing year. And what kind of challenges uh, you faced when you go back to your country and uh, try to implement your new ideas, skills, uh, knowledge to bring change? Can I, can yes. I just jump in? Uh, yes, I, I know about challenges, but one thing I did uh, when I came for the Humphrey Fellowship, you know, I noted down, you know, some of those challenges which I was anticipating. And one of the things I realized um, with, with, with fellowships, there's a tendency of, you know, some people, you know, you leave home, you know, and you disappear for a year, five years. No one has heard about you. Your employer has not heard anything about you. And then you go back home and, you know, expect somebody to receive you with, uh, you know. So one thing I decided is to really keep my employer involved with the things I was doing. Because when I was going to attend maybe immigration court, I would say, oh, I'm going to immigration court. What, can, uh, what, what, what do you want me to learn that I can bring back? So that really helped a lot. And when I went back home, that's one thing my boss told me that, Agnes, among all the things you did was really to keep me, you know, uh, informed about this. And when I went back, he actually asked me now, Agnes, where do I put you? 
because he has seen that I've, I've really uh, gotten out there and, and done many things, and he's aware. And even when I left uh, Minnesota, because I, I went, I, then I went to Oxford, because I had to inform him, and I wanted to get that European context on issues of human trafficking. So I attended summer school on forced migration at the University of Oxford, and then went back home. So they were really involved in that. So that's one of the things, it's strategies I use. And I also went as a listener. You know, I first listened, I said, I've been away for so long. You people have been ahead. You know, tell me what has been going on. So that's the approach I went, you know, with. Then I started talking later. Have we thought about things like this? And let people own the ideas. So it wasn't like me throwing ideas at them, but, you know, working together collectively, you know, towards one goal. Any other comments? I do think it's awfully important for mm. Those of our uh, students and scholars who receive uh, the resources of uh, the U.S. government to make sure that they stay in touch, mm -hmm. stay don't in get touch. lost. Uh, Catherine Stearns is uh, going to read uh, the first question from uh, someone who is uh, watching. Yes, we have a question from David of New York. Despite the rhetoric from both parties about the importance of winning hearts and minds, soft power programs like Fulbright are hit particularly hard by budget cuts. How can soft power programs like Fulbright demonstrate their value? Well, uh, would any of you like to uh, jump in on that? And how do you demonstrate? I'll take a crack at it. Sure. I mean, I, this is a um, th this is a challenge that we face all the time in a different sphere, but in our educational programs. And and um, I think the first thing to say is uh, you have to pay attention to the really obvious benefits. And though they may not be easily quantifiable, they're there right in. Uh, front of your eyes and they can be very convincing. So it really is important to tell these very specific, very concrete, very compelling stories because uh, they do provide a very strong rationale. Uh, they exemplify what the point of these programs is. And th then the, I think the challenge is how do you quantify that effect so you can demonstrate the effect, you get the proof of concept, then you really need some uh, solid, rigorous research approaches to evaluating how widespread that is. And um, there are plenty of social science techniques for capturing those kinds of, of impacts, uh, but they require a certain investment of their own to be able to, to do effectively. So. The biggest challenge actually of demonstrating the effect of, pro of s programs like this is the challenge of generating enough willpower to do the ev evaluation well. And it's a little bit of a, the person who asked the question raised the budget question. There is a little bit of a cart and horse problem here, which is you either need to bring resources to demonstrating the effectiveness, or you need to take resources away from the programs themselves to demonstrate the effectiveness, which feels like a very difficult short-term decision to, to make, but may in fact be the way that you uh, lay the groundwork to sustain these programs over the long term. Uh, I'll yes, take a crack ahead, at it from a policy standpoint just uh, briefly since we are going through this um, with the Congress at, at this hour. Uh, I think we have to do a better job, and that's part of what we're striving for with the President's um, FY15 budget, is to say up front um, what results we expect. And uh, clearly, um, many of you, um, I know from my uh, 10 years overseas as a public affairs officer, um, the results that stories like Agnes's um, have, but we have to articulate that um, better. We have to articulate it up front. We have to have a mechanism for measuring that as we go along. Um, and at the end of the day, we have to be able to say 
um, what the result was. Not necessarily that we always met the result, but that we can at least um, quantify, we can articulate that result um, in some way that not only um, politicians on both sides can understand, but also that the American people can understand. And that's part of the reason why we're looking at uh, mechanisms that are, are mo more immediate. It doesn't mean that the medium and the longer term engagement um, is not important, but that's part of um, what has to be in our toolkit. But we also have to show in uh, circumstances such as um, uh, news that has been um, uh, coming out of Nigeria more recently um, about the both the problem of Boko Haram generally and specifically the case of um, these 300 um, uh, school children uh, who have been abducted, well, what can we do um, insofar as exchanges, uh, public diplomacy, to address that? And I think there are impacts that we, we can have, um, but we have to be able to articulate those and we have to be able to execute those uh, more effectively. I think those of us on the uh, Fulbright Board um, understand this uh, very well. We spent part of our meeting today listening to one of our English teaching assistants who has returned from Malaysia. And she presented to us a um, program that she has developed to show the multiplier effect. She was teaching in a school. She interacted with her classmates, with her parents, with other personnel at the school, with the community, with policymakers. And by the time she was through, the multiplier effect was thousands and thousands of people that she had touched. That's not something that we have generally talked about. We talk about those lucky ETA students that have that experience. And I think it's been a lesson for us that we have to do a much better job of telling the full story of that impact. All right, it's time for another question here. And I guess we're going to this side of the room. Uh, thank you, uh, President Castor. My name is Greg Shuckman. I'm with the University of Central Florida. So hey. it's nice to see an old Go friend. <laughs> um, and by the way, this uh, program with the mentoring of the comedian, I've got to learn more about that one because that sounds fascinating. <laughs> um, Brett, it's, it's kind of telling that the National Security Council is here being represented because with all the instability that we have around the world, it, it's, it is most certainly a strategic asset that, um, that the White House can use. And it would seem that if anything, we would want to significantly amplify and expand the Fulbright program so that you do have those relationships and placements throughout the world. So if you can sort of address that and at the same token to, to any of you, but uh, you know, President Castor and, and, and others, what should the universities be doing? What aren't we doing that we need to do? Um, there is no doubt that we, we should be expanding the Fulbright program, and, and this administration is deeply committed to that, and I think you only have to look um, as far as both um, the time that the president and senior administration officials um, spend on educational exchanges. The Malaysian Teaching Assistance Program was mentioned well. The president was in Malaysia, and this was um, a, a front and center issue that he addressed um, with um, the president uh, of, of Malaysia. And so this is not a, a secondary issue for this administration. Um, the Global Engagement Directorate at the National Security Council was created under this administration. It is the first time that public diplomacy is um, so prominently involved in the national security apparatus at the White House. Um, so I think that speaks to the importance of it. But I would also say um, that part of expanding um, the Fulbright program and public diplomacy um, more broadly in this kind of budget climate is looking outside of the government. And so the president was at a roundtable on Monday um, that uh, we organized that um, addressed this very issue. And he sat down with the heads of uh, university associations and with the head, uh, heads of several uh, prominent uh, U.S. and foreign companies and said, we need you to invest in educational exchanges. Um, it may seem to the private sector that this is a corporate social responsibility. Um, I'm going to tell you that it's not. I'm going to tell you as the head um, of um, the United States and as, as a, a world leader that this is fundamentally about our, our competitiveness. It is about 
creating the workforce that we need. Um, and he is very articulately m making that argument. He's making that both in public as well as in private to world leaders. Um, and it is having an impact. We've seen, for instance, in the case of Brazil, they have um, their science mobility program that will send 101,000 uh, students, uh, particularly in the STEM area, um, overseas and primarily to the United States. Um, the Undersecretary of uh, Foreign Affairs from Mexico was at the round table and he spoke uh, of their program for 100,000 uh, Mexicans uh, to go overseas, particularly again to the United States. So it's something that foreign governments are investing, it's something that the private sector um, has stepped up to and, and it's a case that we will continue to make very aggressively. Well, I'd just like to uh, jump in and also say, although there are really wonderful university systems all over the globe, that the higher education system here in the U.S. really is the envy of the world, continues to be. And I think our universities and now <coughs> community colleges and Fulbright program has more programs now, exchanges with uh, community colleges, and the involvement of universities outside of uh, the old established universities that were the leaders originally in all of these global exchanges. Universities everywhere in this country want those exchanges. Presidents want to foster those exchanges. As we know from the Open Doors Report, which is is issued annually, there are more American students going abroad now than ever before. So the little Fulbright program, we're, we're a small cog in a, in a much larger uh, plan at the university and state levels and private institutions to really uh, foster exchanges and I'm sure you're seeing that as well from your uh, perspective so but there there's no doubt that if we are going to maintain our hegemony uh, in the world we have got to take advantage of the talents of students and um, and faculties and uh, educators from other parts of the world as well. But thank you for the, the, the question. Yeah. We have a question from our online audience. Um, Moji Sola from Illinois asks, how can we improve the security and education for girls globally? Thank you. Uh, Agnes, did you hear that question? Uh, how can we uh, improve the security for girls globally and uh, throughout the world? I can tell you that this whole issue of tra trafficking, human trafficking, is just as important here in the good old U.S. as it is uh, globally. And I, I've seen a lot of uh, forums and discussions uh, recently uh, on this topic, so this is, uh, this is one aspect, uh, mm -hmm. but there are many others in the uh, educational uh, arena, uh, and all of the members might want to uh, chime in on what you've seen with uh, the education of, uh, of girls and opportunities for girls. We're lopsided now at Fulbright. We have many more uh, young women and women in our programs uh, than males. We're looking for a few good males, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. Mm -hmm. I guess, would you like to say anything? I, I think uh, what is important is that, you know, those are all our girls. Uh, it's all our responsibility. And when a girl is affected anywhere in the world, we should be concerned. And for me, when I see the overpowering, because w when I look at, you know, people walking in different cities and saying free our girls and not just, you know, then that's not just looking at them as Nigerian girls, you know, but our girls. So a girl anywhere is really, you know, a girl, you know, worth it. Because um, when I look at my story, uh, you know, being born a girl and be, it was scandalous, you know, in, in, my, in my village, my own paternal aunt, you know, you know, looked at me and, and, and was very disappointed. And my mother had to live, you know, with that because girls are seen as useless, not worth it, and not going to school. So for me, being whom I am today is just an example for other girls, you know, that you have to rise up, that you're worth something. I'm sorry, because <laughs> this is kind of emotional for me. Yes, I'm yeah. sure it is. Let me get. 
There's a not, there are several uh, several uh, folks with their hands up right up here in the front. Oh. Thank you very much. My name is Gabriel Bala, and I'm Fulbright Visiting Scholar at the Library of Congress. And uh, my question, I have plenty of questions, just with outline a couple of them. Uh, actually, I would like to know, uh, I'm a legal scholar, and back home I'm going to propose some institutional changes to find the corruption. But uh, I want to quote uh, Secretary Kerry when introducing um, fiscal uh, budget for the next year. Actually, he says that all over the world, people rely on American leadership to make a change. And I would like to know what is the best channel to also propose and request the leadership of United States to make a change back home? Because, you know, somehow I feel that uh, when we are going back and our uh, proposals are not that greeted, Back home, we are stuck just uh, with our ideas. Not always, but in many cases. And my second question is uh, to you, and how it's to be a, a, you know, a member of the Fulbright Scholarship Board, and what are the selection criteria for that? Oh, <laughs> Thank you're you. very tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and very and tough. where are you from? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, I'm from Armenia. From Armenia. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank very you. tough. Would you like to <laughs> jump in on this? Uh, sure. Um, you know, it is it is a question that is is often asked. You know, how how do you um, bring to bear in, in almost any circumstance? I mean, I, I remember very distinctly serving in uh, the Ivory Coast, and um, on both sides of the conflict, people would say, "Well, you know, we need the United States to come and to solve this conflict," which really mm -hmm. meant, "Well, come and um, side with us." Um, and Certainly, the United States, as uh, Secretary Kerry and, and President Obama have uh, articulated, has a very important role to play. But I think we can also play um, a role by example, and we can also empower others. And I think that's part of the vision of the Young Leaders Initiative, of the Fulbright Program, um, is to share um, some of um, the both the the ideology, the values, as well as the tools. I think increasingly we're talking about tools when we're talking about technology, when we're mm -hmm. talking about innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, so it's far better if we can equip a new generation um, with that training, with that technology, and with those tools than for us to come and uh, to inject ourselves into um, uh, local situations which we may not um, be best equipped to, to help resolve. And I think what you're seeing, for instance, in the case of Africa is a generation that is emerging that has access to um, not only uh, the tools and the technology, but simply, and I'm speaking in the case of Madagascar, the, the fact that um, young people have mobile phones, have internet and social media, that they can see and, and experience in a way that was never possible before the realities, the freedom, the opportunity that exists elsewhere in the world is an incredibly um, empowering experience. And then that is followed up by actually being able to affect change. Granted, it, it, is, it, it is taking place in, um, in some cases in, in glacially slow um, stages. But take a look at the Bring Our Girls Back campaign that has been launched in Nigeria and has captured world attention, has captured attention across um, uh, the, the continent and in, in communities across Nigeria. I think that is an incredibly powerful example of how um, American technology, innovation, uh, ideals um, are being put into practice in, in a local context, in, in, um, in this case by um, young people, by um, uh, groups that perhaps have historically been disadvantaged or marginalized and are now feeling empowered. And I think that's um, the kind of change that, that we hope to see in the world. Yeah. In answer to your question about the Fulbright Board, the Fulbright Board is a 12-person board uh, appointed by the president. I would like to uh, ask the members who, are, who have remained if they would just stand uh, so that you could, Susan Ness is here, Krista Gilman, and our chair uh, that you met at the, Tom Healy, who you met at the beginning of uh, the session. Um, there are no requirements. We just uh, make our, uh, we have to be U.S. citizens and we, uh, we indicate a desire to be on the board and 
there is some vetting. It, there, there, it is a political world that we live in, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. We, um, we have a question from um, the BBC World Service. Um, Marie Christine asks um, you, um, is there an expectation that partner countries will compensate for the unprecedented budget cuts that the Fulbright program is faced with? This is for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, uh, we have really not uh, seen the, the cuts in this uh, fiscal year, although we anticipate that if there is no change next year, we may, uh, we may have some uh, modest reduction in our budget. Uh, we really are um, encouraging uh, grantees around the world and uh, participation around the world. We have a, a number of grants that are called hyphenated grants in which private sector partners, or in some cases university partners, uh, will contribute to our uh, various programs. But uh, we are going to uh, support uh, the administration in its uh, desire to uh, create broad uh, programs and we'll be working as as hard as we can to build, uh, to, to retain our effectiveness. And if I could just, um, from the- but Thank you for that. <laughs> from the administration standpoint, um, we actually um, see the, the FY15 budget as an enhancement of the Fulbright program. And I know at first glance it may um, not seem so, but um, look at some of the, um, emphasis that we have placed not only on rapid response exchanges, which is um, uh, at funded at $25 million. We've enhanced the uh, educational advising um, component substantially. Um, that is um, a, an important investment because we are in a world where um, we're facing competition um, as um, the um, President, uh, so so rightly mentioned, we have long enjoyed um, a place um, amongst the the most um, well-respected universities in the world, um, and we we still to this day do. But um, there are emerging um, universities uh, in both uh, Europe, but also in Asia, in Latin America. Uh, in the Middle East that are competing for students. And we have to make investments, not only um, in, in terms of bringing the best and the brightest here um, for uh, Fulbright scholarships, but in, in terms of competing for those students in the global marketplace. And, and that requires resources. We have a fantastic network of uh, Education USA centers around the world um, that provide resources uh, for free to students who are interested in studying in the U.S. We are creating an office um, in uh, the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs at the State Department to encourage more Americans to go overseas. You know, we, we've talked about the, the increasing um, level of U.S. students that are pursuing study abroad, but it's not enough. Um, we have not seen the kinds of, of increases um, that would keep pace with globalization. We need a generation of American workers that are able to reach across borders to find solutions um, and opportunities, and that's going to require many more Americans uh, to pursue uh, study overseas, and we have to make the case to them that it is no longer a, a luxury for a few, but it is a necessity for many. Um, so we, we are, are investing in that, um, and I would lastly say um, we've also substantially increased the alumni engagement budget, which does directly hit on many of the programs um, that were, were uh, mentioned as part of the Fulbright effect. If we are going to magnify the Fulbright effect, we have got um, to invest at the tail end as well as at um, the start of the program, and that's what we're intent on doing. So, thank you. Thank you. We have time for perhaps one more. One last you question. Could I, I just oh, like yes, to please. add to that, not, not specifically about budget um, uh, amounts, but I think uh, what Brett just said is really very important, that uh, as important as the number of people that are supported by these programs is the quality of support that they, that they receive and um, the quality of academic advising that they get before and during and even after their experiences is, is critical in, in the successfulness of a program like this. 
uh, you, you do have to remember that these are people from different cultures and, and that they are entering, part of this is, is entering into a very different culture, whichever direction you're going, and uh, good advising is really important for that. And uh, it also feels a little bit like you are uh, throwing money away if you invest in this experience and then you don't think about the investments you can make uh, in those same people, individuals, uh, after they have completed that, that single I experience. There's a risk of allowing them to drop off a cliff rather than recognizing that a relatively small amount of support or, uh, or contact or continuing education after that core experience can make a huge difference in the long-term or multiplier effect of, of that experience. So it, it really is, you have to look at, at uh, this as an overall thing uh, without paying um, too much attention to the absolute numbers of individuals in any given year. Uh, I, th I think it's important to mention that the Fulbright uh, program has a very active and growing alumni association uh, here at, at home and uh, in all of the states. So um, I know there are some that are probably listening in. Yes, Steve, mm -hmm. thank you for being here. But it's, uh, it's been a huge success and uh, we've really put a lot of emphasis and the association has really reached out and built. Uh, yes, what, would you like to? I just have a, a, a question to carry on from. Oh. This will Brett's, be our Brett's kind uh, of in the hot seat last, there. Uh, our last Hi, Brett. because we're Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Riley. I'm the executive director of the Fulbright Association. We are the largest um, organization um, representing more alumni from the Fulbright program than any other uh, in the world other than state alum. Um, boy, I have so many questions. I'd love to ask them all. Uh, I know we don't have time for that, but I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity, particularly with a live stream, because my inbox is filled with people very upset about a $30 million cut to Fulbright. Um, we have tons of stories to tell, and we're starting to tell some of those stories a lot more effectively. Of course, I'm a 501c3. We have no money. So a $3 million increase to the state alum budget without a conversation with its largest alumni community seems to be missing the mark. Um, to cut the Fulbright program, I, I'm still missing where the, the rationale is to suggest that this is actually supporting the program. <coughs> So I think one of the big questions that I keep getting is why isn't Yali and the Southeast Asian leaders falling under the umbrella of Fulbright? So you have 70 years of history, focus on your strengths, not your weaknesses. The BBC asked a very good question because the more that we retract from funding Fulbright, our partners in those bilateral relationships will continue to recoil themselves and funding will eventually die. So I'm interested to know, I guess we could talk about the alumni funding separately, but why isn't Yali part of Fulbright? And perhaps you could comment a little bit about how you see making Fulbright a little more adaptable in the future to address some of those more kind of rapid response type opportunities. Let me take the, uh, the last part of your question first. And, and that is we are um, very closely looking at ways in which um, we can um, make um, adaptations, as you said, um, to um, not change fundamentally what the Fulbright program does, but um, I think few um, who've not participated um, in the discussion, broad discussions about the Fulbright program know that there are actually a number of different components that fall under the Fulbright uh, line. And, and you raise a, a good question um, when you say, well, why um, aren't the Young Leaders Initiatives falling under that line? Um, you know, I think part of it, um, quite frankly, comes down to, to simply how um, the budget is um, compiled, and, and I won't get into the details of that, but suffice it to say, the Fulbright program has a incredibly important role to play as we roll out these new initiatives, and we are very closely looking at um, that role. Um, one, I would say that the Fulbright program, um, as you note, um, has 70 years of experience, has 70 years of um, name recognition, um, which allows us to um, leverage new partnerships. It allows us um, to attract the best and the brightest um, as part of these programs. And so um, what I would emphasize is that the Young Leaders Initiatives um, are really in, in a nascent um, stage, and we are still very much in the process of developing 
um, those initiatives. The president just uh, launched the um, Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative and did so um, actually calling for a conversation about what form um, it will take, and, and that is still very much in development. I would stay tuned over the course of the next year um, for more information uh, about that, but I would not rule out um, that Fulbright um, would not play an important role in that process. And it, it doesn't preclude um, a, a, a partnership, it doesn't preclude um, utilizing um, some of the great resources, the great um, abilities of um, the Fulbright and experience of the F Fulbright program to benefit as part of these young leaders initiatives. Um, I think uh, we are, are in the process of exploring, as I, I mentioned at the outset, um, a number of new models, many of which will be incorporated into other programs, whether they are the International uh, Visitor Program, whether it's the Fulbright and the Humphrey Program. Um, but I think the benefits um, both to the Fulbright Program as well as um, to others will be exceptional. Uh, um, as the Vice President of the National Geographic um, Society said so well, it's about the quality. And we are, we are very focused on this question of what quality are we producing through our exchanges? And I think um, while at the um, first glance you can look at it and say, um, well, there will be X um, number of, of Fulbrights um, that, that may be um, not available, and I, I would put a, a, um, an asterisk on that because we continue to work very hard at outreaching and leveraging new partnerships. Um, and if we can spend $100,000, which is what a Fulbright uh, normally costs in, in just one year, or two years rather, um, it, and we can use that to leverage um, uh, money from the private sector, from foreign governments, from other associations, um, and that brings in tenfold, um, that's money well spent. And so um, I, I think you um, need to take a, a, a global perspective, you need to take a, a hard look at um, what we are getting out of these exchange programs. And we are very focused on ensuring that in the 21st century, in this budget uh, environment, we are getting um, every um, result that we promise and more. Uh, Steve, I would only um, add to that by saying that the Fulbright Board is very aware of the job we have ahead of us in telling the Fulbright story. As you know, the Fulbright has changed over the years. Uh, in the beginning, we were very Eurocentric. That's not true anymore. Uh, we, have a, we have a global program uh, in the hemisphere itself. Uh, we have increased our numbers exponentially. Uh, we have a new Nexus program, the whole uh, ECA program. The ETA program is a relatively new program to place English teaching speakers uh, all over the globe, and that's been working very well. So I would uh, submit to my colleague that we do understand, we have been flexible, we are changing, and I, I think in the uh, years ahead, we, we've gotten the message that we have to do a much better job uh, at branding, at telling our story, and at being collaborative, and we intend to do that. Uh, I wish we could take more uh, questions and uh, hear more commentary, but we have, uh, we have passed the uh, time of uh, adjournment. So again, I want to thank all of you for coming. Please feel free to stay around and chat. And thanks to the panel members. Thanks to you.